Uh, probably like Monday when I walked into the room and there was 30 new faces and I had to introduce myself to everybody. Um, no, I mean, I think the most challenge, it's probably the most fun is just getting to know people really. So it just, it's a lot of brand new relationships um, and like important relationships. Um, and so like just spending time, like FaceTime with, with Jed and Carter, um, with you know, driving down to Wrigley like w once or so a week and just getting to know people. Um, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't happen overnight and nothing is really critical to happen overnight, but starting getting those relationships going forward and connecting to those people is really important. As a baseball fan, have you ever seen or experienced anything like the Otani thing that's going on? You know, just as a fan, because I know it's not fair to ask you directly. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's deserved um, because he's, he's very unique. So it's, it's really cool what's happening. And I think as a baseball fan, we all want to know where the great players are going to play. Um, yeah, I mean, I think so that's probably maybe the challenging part of this is just learning like you know i think as as a manager on the other side you have a pretty good sense of like the core of the big league team and so moving yourself past like the core of the big league team to to get to understand like like important prospects on the team like that that's probably been the part that it, like you spend some time learning and still like even in this this period of the winter meetings like really familiarizing yourself of like how the organization talks about those players and, and that's that's a, an important part um, because I, you know when you get to spring training you know we're not making decisions on Dansby Swanson but you are going to make decisions on some of those important players that are kind of knocking on the door and so getting a, a good feel for those players um, is, is almost more critical at this time of the year than, than, than the former. Is that, is that just research at this point? You're calling those guys? No, it's research. It's definitely research at this point and just talking to people around the organization, yeah. What have you thought of the dynamic just sort of in the office with Carter, with Jed, Carter, Joe Giardi? about the interface a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> What's this process been like? Yeah, I mean, yeah, so I'm the outside eyes and I'm going to come in and I'm, I, mean, I have opinions um, and I'm going to share them. Um, and um, I think that's that's healthy. I think that's probably something that's that I can maybe just help with in, in, in little ways. Um, you know, they. I think, you know, that's why I'm here to, to try to make, you know, you try to help the Cubs win games, but you try to do that you know, by making things better on, on in every possible way you can. Um, but I've, I've enjoyed that part of it. I mean, I, like last Friday, I spent the afternoon or the day down at Wrigley and had some very productive conversations with, with Jed and Carter and, um, you know, re have really enjoyed that part of it so far. Yeah, I mean, look, like, I, I, we're solving for wins. That's it. And you can, you can, you win a rot, you win with players. There's 26 players that that you get a chance to do that with. Um, how you utilize them is different. What they're good at is different. Um, and so that's you know, and if you can get one player that adds up to a lot of wins, that's that's helpful. There's no question about it. Um, but you're solving for wins, and that's a puzzle you're putting together. Um, that's, that's the hard part about roster building, um, and it's the challenge that every team faces uh, in an offseason with player movement. How different is it for you coming from an organization where you probably had a limited payroll when you went to the winter meetings and maybe had to be more creative and become Cubs who have more Yeah, I mean, look, the names, are, the names you're discussing are different. I mean, there, there's no question about it. And the conversations you can be involved in are different. Um, you know, I think the, um, you know, the, the, but I will say like the efficiency with that, that kind of efficiency, but the different ways that 
different markets have to look at it is, is helpful, I think, to provide like a new new ideas um, just to the, just hopefully idea generation about ways to get better still. As you do this transition, have you been on the phone with some free agents? Um, yeah, n not, not, not a lot, but yes, yeah. Craig, have you guys met with Otani? And the reason I'm, this is in the context of Dave Roberts just described in detail their meeting with him. Um, have you guys met with him? I have not. As no, I have not. When, when you were introduced, you talked about uh, how it's close, right? And, and it's in a good, they're, they're in a good situation when you talk about prospect capital or money. Uh, they're in a good situation. How important is it to capitalize on moments like this so that two years from now we don't have to say we have that problem? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, it, like play, young players, there's there's development with young players. So it's not just like, oh, it, it's not this and this, get a player close to the big leagues and then trade them. I, I don't think that's how you think about this. It's like we have young players, That's that creates great depth in the organization. Depth is a way to solve for wins. It really raises your floor as, as a team. So I, you know, I think players continuing to develop. Not every prospect turns out to be a regular major league player, um, but some turn out to be better than you think too. So it's good to have, I think at this time, the Cubs have like a really good foundation and base and, and numbers right now, along with some potential like, you know, high end players. And, you know, that that's at this time of the year that creates a lot of conversation, but it's also, it's also trying to figure out ways to keep those guys developing so that they add wins to the major league team. In your, in your search, what set Ryan Flaherty yeah, I mean, I think I've always just like I don't I don't know Ryan Wealth going into this search, um, but you know I, I've always had great respect for him. He's done really good things quickly in his coaching career. Um, he's earned an excellent reputation. Um, and he's been very good with players. And I, and I think that just relationship that he has, like it's really hard as you start coaching to like kind of separate yourself as a coach and still be great with players. And I think Ryan's just done an excellent job of that. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I th look, that's what this part of this is about change. So that, that was certainly something I thought about a little bit um, during that. Um, but, you know, in, in just talking to Ryan, um, it, you know, although you, I didn't know him well, like personally, which I think we sometimes, we, you know, there's, I think it's good that I don't, I like that part of it actually. And, I, and talking to him, I did feel like I knew him very well. Um, and I did feel like I know where our conversations are going to go. Um, and I'm looking forward to like a, like a new, a uh, fresh set of eyes there um, to, to help me see different things. As you, went through the, as you went through the process of evaluating the existing coaching staff, what led you to the decision, generally speaking, to, to keep the group largely intact? And, and yeah. like how valuable, I guess, did you ultimately decide that that was, and, and just can you take us through kind of like that process for you? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, look, a bit of a late start on the coaching staff process for, for a number of reasons. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, in large part decided that this was the staff that they wanted to come back with again, and they're just talking to them and um, frankly talking around the industry about them. Um, I, I've felt like it was a good, a largely a good staff in place, and there were some really good pieces in place, um, and that there were some places for growth on the staff that I think I can help with, um, and, and, and really I'm look, looking forward to doing that with some of these guys. Um, there's, there's some like just really good tools there that I think we can use um, and hopefully make better and in the end just to help players um, that's what our job is as coaches and that's what our coaching staff's job is to help the players um, make help the players be better at their jobs um, and I think we have some really good tool sets on this coaching staff to do so on the topic of uh, Ryan Clary, he and Carlos Rodon have been 
Carter Hawkins were college teammates at Vanderbilt. Do you think that that helps at all to have that pre-existing relationship? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's funny. So, like, that uh, there's there's different connections, and 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 def, certainly Carter and and Ryan have a connection. Um, I don't, I don't know if it helps me at all that they have that connection. Maybe it, maybe it will, um, but I think you know I, my connections were were through some Vanderbilt people as well. Pedro Alvarez, um, who, who Ryan knew very well, is a, is a friend and, and um, somebody that that's, I've worked with a little bit. So you know I think Ryan more so it's just how Ryan has done his job the last four years as a coach is what really interested me in, in him. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, if you're in one place for a long time, it's almost like you're learning. A, there, there's a part of it where you're learning a different language, um, you know, in terms of like just the information systems that a team uses. It's a different language and that and just learning to speak that language a little bit and learning to read that um, is is. I'm it's hard, I, I will tell you that, um, because you want to speak the same language that everybody's speaking and how, how we do evaluations, how we consider player development, things like that. And so that's the part that getting up to speed, um, it, you know, it does not happen overnight and it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while for sure. <laughs> Have, yeah. Knowing for the first time this year that the starting pitchers dropped under an average of five uh, innings for the first time, is that a reality that managers have to look at down the road? Yeah, it, it's really. Um, I, I always think it's personnel based. I do think there is look. There's times in a season where if you have optionable starters and you can go to a sixth pitcher, it's going to help just for recovery. Um, but it, it, it has to work and it involves roster movement and it involves, it affects the bullpen. So it's, you know, it, it's really personnel based to me. There are times in the season when do I think it's helpful for, for the starting pitchers? Absolutely, I think it's helpful. Um, but I think it has to work and it can't, you can't, you can't do it and let it affect the rest of the roster or affect the team to, to the point where you either lose games or you cost yourself the games down the road. Correct. With Jim Lamont going in the Hall of Fame, was, what was your experience playing for him and are there things that he did as a manager that maybe you can now fuck back on? Yeah, I mean, look, Jim was my first manager in the big leagues, essentially. Um, and um, so I have great fondness for him. I, I've talked to him during the month of October when I was going through this process. Um, um, you know, and I was very interested in his you know, and, and what he, how he thought about like when he eventually left a place that he that he had been for a long time. Um, so, you know, I, I consider him a friend first of all. Um, but but I'm you know just thrilled for him, so happy for him. He deserves it. He he is somebody that, um, especially as I was thinking about just managing as as a job, you know, long ten years ago or whatever. Um, you know, he was an inspiration for it, for sure. Um, and, and if I could, you know, you're, you're kind of like, can you live up to somebody like that? It's, it's always something you have in your back of your mind. Yeah, I mean, I, I think just from looking at Christopher and just, all, all, you know, across the field and, um, you know, he's put himself in a position where he needs to be in the lineup, he needs to be on the field. Um, and that's that's a good thing. Now, now where, like, that's where we have to figure out. But I, I, I think, like, to, to sit here on, like, December 7th or whatever, no, December 3rd and say we've got to have it figured out, I, I like, or that he might be a versatile piece, like, yeah, I mean, Mookie Betts was a versatile piece for a, for a pretty good team, you know. So I think that's how, you know, I think he's earned his way into a lineup. There's no question about that. Um, he's an exciting young hitter. Um, just the nature of he's kind of forced his way into lineups and 
they the Cubs have at the, up to this point moved him around the field um, because he's forced his way into the lineup, and that's a good thing. Uh, I, I see that as a really good thing. The the positional part, um, you know, we're we're going to have to figure that out, um, and that's 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 going to be part of the challenge of of spring training. But I don't know that I'm going to tell you like. This is the position. Um, I don't think that helps the team. I think positional versatility, like you know, creates a good floor for your team, so that when things inevitably happen to your team during the season, that you can that you're choosing from better options than just one option. Um, and so that's where the the players that have defensive versatility are incredibly valuable players. Yeah. What do you expect? Yeah, I mean, I think so. The one thing I saw last year is like as the season went on, say I became a very dangerous hitter. Um, and to the, to the point of like, you know, there were stretches where he, he was just a scary, scary bat in the lineup and someone that you had to really, really be careful of um, as an offensive player. So I, I think it, he's take, he keeps taking steps forward as a hitter in the major leagues. Um, and, and, you know, if you one more step and we're, you know, we're talking about like a really scary offensive player for the rest of the league. How would you describe uh, your philosophy when it comes to guys wanting to play 162 games? You know, a guy like Dansby who wants to be in the lineup every day. Yeah. Maybe there's that trade off where it's better if you do find rust occasionally. Like, how do you kind of view that concept and handle that with players? Yeah, I mean, I think. So the first thing is just getting to know the players for sure is, is the first thing you have to do. Um, I'm not, a, not opposed to players that play, players want to play every day. Who would be opposed to that? I, you know, that's a good thing for the team. Um, you know, does it make you the best player you can be? Um, is it the best for the team? Like those are the things we have to we have to figure out and we have to assess. And really we do that. I, I don't know. Again, that's not a decision we're going to make on March 15th either. Uh, that's a decision you make as the season goes on. Um, and, and really you make it as like what's best for the team. I think that's how you make the decision. Um, it's not what's best for the individual, it's what's best for the team. You said you have a year of Otani. Is, I mean, knowing who you are, is that supposed to be an indication of the team's interest in him? You know what I'm saying? I mean, look, I, I don't think this is my spot to talk about individual players. It's, it's a great question, but um, you know, not, not the spot to talk about it.